I hope you enjoyed it. It might be depressing for someone, uh, impressive for others, but uh, surely, that's my view at least, it provides uh, concrete, I think also objective, considering the sources which have been mentioned in the, um, in the documentary, it provides an objective and factual background, which helps us to put in a certain perspective the reflections which will be starting shortly. We will share these reflections thanks to the precious presence of two distinguished guests. I will start from my left, from my left Martinino, reader, Faculty of Law and Institute for Environmental Sciences at the Geneva University, lead legal specialist, platform for International Water Law Geneva Water Hub. Welcome, Mara. Thank you for being here. Actually, I must say twice thank you, because Mara has just landed from New York, where she was until a few hours ago, for some commitments at the new end. That's, is that right? So, I hope your trip was fine. <laughs> You're not too much tired, and I, I really appreciate your presence here. Then, uh, of course, my warm welcome also to Pier Andrea Leucci, uh, legal officer, uh, Directorate General for Maritime Affairs and Fisheries, at the European Commission in Brussels. Welcome to Geneva. Uh, ben Andrea is also president of Ascomare, uh, president legal advisor of Ascomare, an association which provides assistance and uh, counseling in the context of law the sea related uh, matters. Uh, I don't think I will need to add anything from a scientific, also because I'm not entitled to. <laughs> but in the factual point of view. The, the impact of climate change due to the excess of uh, grass, uh, greenhouse gas emissions contributions, I think it's very clear to everyone. It would, it, I'm sure it was already clear, but now that we have in mind some uh, images seen, we know that uh, the, the impact really goes in different directions. We have seen uh, we've seen and we heard talking about uh, sea rise level, about sea acidification, sea deoxygenation, uh, war sea warming. In general, we have seen talking about significant and deleterious alteration of the chemistry of the sea, which in turn has, of course, effects on the flora the fauna, the entire marine ecosystem in general, on a global level, because it's not, of course, a regional, a regional um, issue. And as we will see shortly, uh, in turn, all this leads and brings effects also on a social, human rights, economic point of view, to mostly the, population, the coastal populations who live or survive also thanks to fishing. Without uh, now dissipating, because we will do that uh, in more details later on, without uh, forgetting that the sea, um, the sea rise, the, the level sea rise, of course, will in some decades oblige hundreds of millions of people to displace, to flee, to leave their territories because of the concrete impossibility to live there. So, I will not go beyond this, for the moment at least. Um, I just wanted to give these examples and share them with you, just to give an idea about how the impact of climate change goes really in several directions and can be analyzed under several points of view. This is the reason why I'm really happy to have here someone who is an expert not only in fishing but in many other things and I'm sure that the contributions from the contribution from Pin Andrea will help us to understand which are the multi-layer implications of climate change on sustainable use of marine living resources. For is yours.
Thank you very much, uh, Andrea, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first and foremost, uh, thank you very much for the invitation, and uh, I think also we discussed uh, a little bit uh, this uh, yesterday, I mean, for the uh, dedication and the passion also put uh, in um, uh, organizing this kind of event. I think uh, it's very, very important also to create this kind of fora, eh? these uh, platforms for discussions, for having an informal dialogue on the topic and uh, uh, consolidating, establishing a network. Eh? Uh, among different experts in different fields, uh, as uh, Andrea mentioned, I think it was clear also from the documentary we are talking about the uh, interrelated aspect and implications of climate change. Yeah? So, um, the, the thing, I mean, uh, the, the, we were discussing before with this excellency, I mean, the, the, there is a, a clear, uh, we, we can, we can see already what is the impact of climate change you know in the in the eating waves during summers in the changing the climate conditions also in uh, i come from the south of italy this is uh, is pretty much evident but uh, uh, i mean uh, this is something uh, there are two elements that come into my mind especially after seeing this uh, documentary the first one is the concept that this uh, idea of the human dominated epoch you know this anthropocene uh, which uh, starts at the end of, let's say, uh, almost 11,000 years of uh, relatively thriving conditions for humans and nature. Eh? Now we are, uh, uh, in the, you, we can see the anthropogenic pressures, you know, posed on the marine environment, for instance, uh, which create a number of uh, implications, as Andrea mentioned, that goes beyond environment per se, but these are human implications, economic implications. How we try to touch upon some of them, for instance, in this intervention. And uh, the second aspect, I mean, if we really need to find a synthesis for uh, what we, we've seen and what we are going to discuss, uh, I think that, uh, and this is interesting because one of the points was mentioned in the documentary, I remember one of the experts say, we don't know uh, how the impact will be. We don't know that. And this element of uncertainty is really the fil rouge, you know, connecting all these different interrelated areas. Now, uh, I'm a jurist. Uh, I've been involved in, in a number of uh, important international negotiations. Uh, to me, uncertainty, from a legal standpoint, is really a bug, you know, in the normative system. So you see. Uh, uncertainty sometimes happens because of a uh, compromise. You know, we really need to keep the concept of vague enough to strike an agreement, for instance. Uh, sometimes it's the result of a mistake. We, we make poor decisions. Eh? And in other circumstances, it's the result of a change. And uh, the element with the change is a little bit more complicated because there is this element, as I stressed before, of unpredictability, which really, I mean, even trying to foresee as much as possible something, we never 100% really grasp what would be the implication of certain actions. You know? And I mean, one example, for instance, as Andrea said, is sea level rise. You know? This is something uh, which now, even in the international scene, we know there are a lot of discussions about uh, uh, what could be the legal implications of sea level rise. You know, for instance, you have an island, there is a, the level of the water uh, rising, it may change the legal status of an island. It can turn that in a submerged natural features. And then what do we do in terms of boundary delimitations, for instance? Do we take that into account or we don't? I mean, as you can see, there are so many aspects which are involved. The element of uncertainty, I think, is uh, the protagonist uh, when it comes to the development of the new environmental regulatory framework since the early 90s. Eh? Uh, some of you probably are already familiar with a very important event uh, which uh, uh, happened in uh, 1992, is the UN Conference on Environment and Development. Um, uh, this uh, conference was very important for a number of reasons. I mean, I mean it was the conference uh, where the um, uh, framework convention on climate change, for instance, was adopted, the convention on biological diversity, we have the Agenda 21, the ancestor of the new sustainable development goals, but there is another one which is actually the, the non-legally binding document adopted there, which is the Rio Declarations, because the conference was held in Rio de Janeiro, which really, in a way, uh, is the triumph of uh, the new paradigm 
under international environmental law dealing with uncertainty is uh, declarations on sustainable development. The concept of sustainable development was uh, developed uh, a couple of years before, thanks to the work of a Brundtland Commission, it was a commission of experts appointed by the UN, which defines sustainable development as a, the development which meets the needs of present generations without compromising the rights of future generations to meet their own needs. Very long definition, in short, intergenerational equity is the concept that you don't really know the impact that what we do today could have tomorrow on the generation, on the future generations. And this element is encapsulated in a very con important concept and principle in this real declaration, which is the principle of precaution. Now, and this is really the protagonist of today policies when it comes to the environment. So is the idea that we, there is something we don't know we, we accept the uncertainty and we stop in front of uncertainty. So, uh, Professor Friston said that the, the precautionary principle is a modification of the role played by scientific data. Uh, this is a kind of uh, you know, definition I always like it because uh, it's the idea indeed that the, there is a scientific uncertainty. Certain things that we don't know and so if we don't know we have to stop. And this is the, 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 the preconditions uh, also. And of course, this is the we have to address uh, and consider certain important why. But then we have countries, <coughs> for instance, in Sub Saharan Africa, Africa, like Senegal, Sierra Leone, uh, uh, Somalia, where the consumption is up to the 80%. And we are talking about population where, I mean, most of the population in some of these countries lives below the poverty line. There isn't really a choice. I mean, uh, it's either fish or fish. And uh, so you can understand already what could be uh, the, the implications, for instance, of over-exploitation, of mismanagement of stocks in terms of food security. The second one is there are uh, about 58.5 million people in the world employed in fisheries. Now, this uh, is just, of course, uh, the number of people working in fisheries and processing activities but not, for instance, everything going around that, you know, like the transportation of the, the fish, the marketing of the fish. We are talking about a lot of jobs, a lot of families, a lot of people working in this field. And the fisheries is considered, in the last half century, has always been considered every year as the deadliest profession in the world, together with hunting. Yeah? Uh, so it's important also to adopt the right safety, for instance, the labor uh, standards. Yeah? So it's very important for social security also, no? The third aspect, uh, there are so many people employed in fisheries because fisheries is, uh, in terms of market, you can say, in 2020, FAO reported that the turnover of fisheries was something like 480 billion US dollar. And this is just the legal part of fisheries, eh? because then some of you probably heard about the high EU fishing, no illegal and reported and regulated fishing. I mean, there is also the legal market, which is very profitable. No? Uh, so, in terms of uh, economic impact, especially for certain sectors, for the pelagic, like the tuna industry, is a very profitable one. No? Uh, and the last point is uh, FAO reports that one third of the commercial stock today are overexploited. Now, overexploited, uh, uh, so one out of three. Overexploited uh, is a very complex concept, uh, I mean, but uh, just in short, let's say that when there is a mismatch between, for instance, the uh, catching rate and the reproduction rate, of course there are other elements which can have an influence on that, on this process, but all in all, the, the problem is not even the level of overexploitation, but the fact that in the last 50 years this overexploitation increases over 25%. So. Uh, if we need to summarize all of that, we can see that uh, less fish means uh, less food, less jobs, less money, less nature. And this, of course, has a huge impact on human security. So the connection between fisheries and human security is, uh, is clear, I mean, it's plain. What about climate change here? Uh, forgive me for the very trivial example. But uh, let's imagine that someone, uh, you know, someone breaking in your apartment and setting the thermostat uh, of your apartment at some sustainable levels. You, know. you cannot change it. Uh, I mean, you are left with uh, two main options. Either you move into a new apartment or, I mean, you die. 
if we neglect the, the adaptations, of course, uh, process uh, at the basic of evolution. But um, for fish, uh, there are not many times to marine living resources in general. There are not these two choices. I mean, they can, in some cases, they can readapt. But for instance, uh, we know uh, that uh, global warming has a huge impact on um, uh, the more juvenile. Uh, species. Eh? So in this case, uh, for instance, the older specimens can readapt, but not the juvenile. So in any case, there is a decline in the stock, uh, in the, in the stock uh, biomass. In other cases, they need to move. And moving has, again, huge implications. So I want to give you two examples. These are practical examples. The first one is, um, I mean, in uh, Laos, uh, early 2000, for instance, there was a huge uh, um, uh, climate crisis. Uh, the majority of the people in Laos is a landlocked state, so used to work in agriculture. This destroyed uh, completely most of the fields. These people had no other options than moving to neighboring countries illegally, uh, Thailand, and uh, most of them ended up on board the fishing vessels, working on board fishing vessels illegally. Well, a couple of years uh, after, uh, thanks to the pressure uh, posed by, uh, put by some NGOs, uh, the government made a survey to see how many people uh, working on these uh, fishing vessels were in good labor conditions. And the government concluded that something like 75% of these people were in slavery conditions. So you can see what are the implications of this, of climate change already. Or other thing, I mean, 80% of the global fleet is a, a small scale, so small, very small vessels. Especially in poor countries, uh, these are not only small vessels, but these are artisanal vessels, artisanal craft. These people cannot move far away from the sea. They normally fish in the coastal areas or up to three nautical miles. So if the fish goes away, if the uh, marine resources moves, they cannot move. They need to find a different job. And this, for instance, is one of the reasons uh, why there was a, a huge spike of piracy in Somalia, for instance, in the early 2000s. So, I mean, there are many different aspects which are connected to the impact that climate change could have, you know, in the relations with fisheries. So, to wrap up, it is uh, evident what is the relations between fisheries, human security, climate change, fisheries, and human security. What can we do? Uh, I don't have the reply, otherwise it would be a Nobel Prize probably, but I can tell you what the Nobel Prize said. Uh, Professor Somaila, uh, the Nobel Prize for Environment, he said that the first step uh, is filling the information gap. So to understand better what is this kind of relations, to invest into science, to uh, try to adopt certain mitigation measures, of course, to address what are the challenges posed by climate change also into fisheries. And this is why, for instance, if you look at the latest uh, um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report in 2023, you will see that there are at least two paragraphs where it's specifically highlighted the relationship existing between climate change and fisheries, how one influences the other. Uh, then, personally, I think, uh, uh, for instance, in the context of the uh, information gap, a uh, uh, great uh, job is the one done by the UN Division for Ocean Affairs and the Low the Sea. Eh? Uh, under the regular process, for instance, they gather uh, scientists and experts every, I think it's five years, to publish uh, what is called the World Ocean Assessment. Uh, very recently was published, I think it was last year, the second one, which includes in volume two a specific sections dealing with climate change and fisheries, for instance, and now they are gathering experts for the third, for the third uh, ocean assessment. Uh, another aspect which is very important, uh, uh, next to, to filling information gap, in my view, is uh, assessing the risk. I mean, we go back to the concept of uncertainty. There are many things we don't know. Okay, once we clarify some of these relations, we, we have to deal with them. I mean, assessment and management of the risk are very important aspects, which uh, fortunately, I think, lately are entering more and more into the, 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 the policy, let's say, aspect, the strategic aspect also taken into consideration by states. Some of you probably heard uh, recently in September there was a opening for signature of the BPNJ, the Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction uh, Treaty Agreement, and it's called it also sometimes the IEC's treaty. Uh, there is uh, something very important there, for instance, there is a definition which was borrowed by other legal uh, instruments, but is uh, of uh, cumulative impact. 
This definition of cumulative impact introduces specifically the impact of climate change of certain activities, for instance fisheries, in the environmental impact assessment process, which is very, very important because when we go to assess what is the impact of a certain activities, we have to take into consideration also these implications. The third and final aspect to me which is very important to take into consideration is uh, adopting an inclusive legislative approach, uh, also in the decision-making process in general. So we saw how big is the world of fisheries and the same we could say for climate change. We should try to put a little bit of one into the other's world and vice versa. So we should try, when we adopt, for instance, new legislative instrument, uh, uh, to uh, try to stress what could be the relation between the two. I give you an example. Uh, I uh, work, for instance, in the fisheries team um, at the European Commission. Uh, uh, last year, no, two years ago, was adopted the, the European Union Maritime uh, Fisheries and Aquaculture Fund, which is a very important uh, piece of EU legislation dealing with fisheries. And inside this piece of legislation, there, is, there are specific mechanisms, financial mechanisms, to mitigate the impact of climate change caused by certain fishing activities. You know? So to, to adopt, to finance low impact, for instance, uh, equipment for fishing vessels. So trying to stress these relations into the, the different legislative instrument could also be very, very beneficial. Uh, that was my last point. Uh, I hope uh, you enjoyed this, this short intervention. And of course, if you have any question, I would be happy to answer later on. Thanks. Many, many thanks, and that was absolutely clear. I think it was really interesting to, to, to focus on the interplay between uh, fisheries, climate change, uh, human rights, uh, labor law, uh, economic issues, uh, risk of for the low-lying islands and territories to be submer submerged by the uh, sea level rise and, uh, and so on. But uh, before uh, giving the floor to, to Maratinino, I mean, I'd like to spend uh, myself as well a few minutes, if you allow me, uh, to share some considerations. And uh, I would, uh, I, I, I will take it from uh, uh, one of the last sentences of your of your uh, of your talk. Um, in particular, I refer to so what to do. Hmm? You've been mentioning uh, different measures which states should take in terms of uh, cooperation, cooperation among states, so within the international community, in terms of filling in the gaps, um, in terms of uh, assessing risks, in terms of adopting certain kind of uh, uh, regulatory um, uh, instruments, uh, in terms of investments, that's really politics, huh? in terms of investments, for instance, this is something I'm adding, <laughs> in renewable and, uh, and uh, um, climate neutral uh, um, uh, source of energy, and, uh, and so on. Now, why I'm taking it from there? Because actually, uh, one of the question is, uh, according to which legal instruments all these, can be, all these measures must be taken? You have been mentioning very, clear, very clearly the uh, UNFCCC, which stands for United Nations Framework Convention on uh, Climate Change, Convention on, Cl on Climate Change. Uh, when when I say the uh, the lens of the road C, I particularly refer to the UN clause, which is the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which entered in force in 1982. It's such an important legal instrument, so to be called sometimes as the Constitution of the Oceans. Uh, among many other topics, the uh, UN clause, so this convention dated 1982, also is also dedicated in its section 12 to the protection of marine environment. Um, but what is, I mean, uh, um, before really going a bit more into details about the kind of obligations which states who have adhered to this convention have, considering that uh, actually almost 200 states have adhered to this convention, so it's basically really almost all the international community, uh, we must really understand what is considered under uh, Lord's hypothesis, what is pollution actually. 
And uh, uh, in this respect, I'm sorry to, I mean, to mention articles because it's, it's, it's never, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, it's always a bit, uh, I mean, um, uh, difficult uh, on, to, to try to uh, remember the specific wording. But what I'm to say is that the Article 1.4, uh, Article 144 of the uh, UN clause defines uh, approximately pollution as the introduction by human of substances, energies uh, in the sea, in the oceans, so to bring deleterious effects. So, uh, in, the, in this UN clause, which is the main instrument, legal instrument at the international level regarding the law of the sea, there is no reference expressly to climate change. Why? Because actually this convention was drafted and negotiated in the 70s of last year, when climate change was not really an issue, at least not such as today. That said, of course, it's, it has, as I was saying, it has a section dedicated to environment. So, uh, considering this convention as a live, as an instrument, we can interpret this, must make an effort of interpretation of this definition, understand whether the alteration of conditions uh, of the marine ecosystem due to greenhouse gas emissions can be considered not pollution. And uh, largely the author's doctrine, and not only say yes, although uh, there is no unanimous consent of this, but the very large part of the international community agree on the fact that the absorption of uh, 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 excess heat as well as um, carbon uh, is an introduction of uh, energy or substance so to bring deleterious effects. So it falls, the phenomena which we have seen, under uh, the definition of pollution according to the UN clause. At that point, we must so uh, really ask, according to this uh, convention, which are the obligations of the, of the, uh, of, of the states. And, uh, uh, just one concept, actually. Uh, if, we, if you read the, the articles of the Convention, starting from Article 192 going on, in particular 192 and 194, uh, you will see that uh, these articles address uh, obligations to, to, to states, but they are always obligations of conduct, not of result, meaning that uh, uh, despite of the fact that for, with the Paris Agreement, uh, the international community has agreed to um, to um, reduce the greenhouse gas emissions to uh, make sure that the temperature will not uh, increase, uh, actually, in, will increase uh, far less than two, um, two, degrees, two Celsius degrees compared to the pre industrial uh, era. Despite of this political goal, there is no legal obligation or result. That's why I was saying that these obligations of the states are obligations of conduct, meaning that uh, states must take all the efforts uh, to assess the risks, as you were saying, and make sure that the um, risk, again, of alteration of, uh, uh, and, um, and damage to marine pollution is minimized, mitigated at least. Uh, this was just to give, uh, uh, I mean, a, a small overview about uh, some, uh, about first of all, definition of pollution under the UN clause, and then about uh, the kind of obligation, again, the obligation of conduct, uh, which relates to the states under the section 12 of the, of the, um, of the UN clause. Uh, I'm about to give the floor to Mara. Uh, maybe you want to add something? Just one comment, Andrea. Thank you very much. Uh, um, indeed, uh, what uh, Andrea is mentioning is also very relevant in the context of two advisory proceedings, eh, which recently were established uh, before uh, the International Court of Justice and the ITLOS, respectively, eh, which will touch upon uh, these provisions in 19, uh, Article 192 and following, uh, taking into consideration what are the obligations of states for uh, climate change. Yeah. Precisely. So. Uh Precisely because we have this kind of obligation of conduct, uh, which actually really rely on each state commitment 
to do the best they can to assess this risk and minimize the uh, damages to my environment. That uh, uh, not even one year ago, because we are talking about December 2022, uh, a certain number of states uh, from the Pacific area and the Caribbean area have filed a request, an advisory request, to the ITLOS, which is the International Tribunal for the Law on the Sea, which function is to uh, settle disputes uh, and uh, apply and interpret the provisions set forth under the UN Clause 1982. And the reason why this uh, commission of states, of insular states from the Pacific area and from the Caribbean area is um, to have filed this request and to understand which are the obligations uh, from the states in general regarding the climate change and the impact on the marine pollution and more general on the marine environment. I will stop here and this is really the subject of the uh, talk uh, which will be given by uh, Mara uh, Marino in a wider context of pollution in light of through the sea. Mara, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. I would like really to thank uh, uh, Andrea for uh, organizing uh, this conference and uh, also uh, uh, um, uh, Pierre Andrea really for the uh, uh, for the overview of, uh, of uh, and the specific uh, focus on uh, on, uh, on fisheries. Uh, um, I think uh, no, that the issue that uh, Pierre Andrea raised about uh, the uh, uh, um, the uncertainty, so how no, we can include uncertainty, the concept of uncertainty in, uh, in, the, in, uh, in international law, in particular in the legal agreements. We have many legal agreements that have been uh, adopted uh, in, the, in the 60s, in the 70s, uh, so how no, we can uh, manage to balance uh, on one side uh, the uh, uh, the stability of international relations that uh, are based on, uh, on international uh, on the rules of international law, and on the other side, you know, the, 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 the issue you know, of, uh, of ad adaptability, you know, how you know, we, we take into account the new, uh, uh, new concern you know, like, uh, like uh, uh, climate change. And uh, uh, maybe if you allow me, you know, since I'm just back from, uh, from New York, I would like to say that I raised this, uh, the, the question of the role of, advisory, of uh, the three advisory opinions, requests for advisory opinions that we have actually to the UN special rapporteurs on the, on the right to an healthy environment. Uh, and also we have a UN special rapporteur specifically that was created uh, on the issue of, of climate change and uh, human rights and I asked this question so uh, also in preparation of this conference uh, uh, and uh, uh, so there is uh, no, the, uh, the, uh, um, the, the the UN special rapporteur they prepared also uh, um, uh, some documents to the international tribunal for the law of the sea they are preparing also uh, their, their position on, uh, uh, on the request for advisory opinion uh, that has uh, been submitted to the International Court of Justice. Uh, uh, so, uh, to, uh, to uh, give the, the, the background, uh, no, we, we have really, uh, no, in, in, in this uh, uh, last, I, I think uh, we, we can say maybe in the last uh, five years, uh, uh, really you know, an evolution uh, in international law how you know, it, is, uh, uh, it is considered climate change. So climate change is, is related to human, to human rights law and also uh, again from my, uh, from, from my uh, mission in, uh, in New York also for example climate change is considered also in the framework of peace processes. So this was uh, no, uh, really interesting uh, that, uh, to see how no, also uh, the climate sensitivities 
uh, should be taken into account also uh, by uh, from uh, by peace builders, so by people you know, involved in uh, in making peace peace agreements. Um, so there is a, a process, for, for example, at the, at the level of the International Law Commission. So the International Law Commission is a, a, a subsidiary body of the uh, um, UN General Assembly composed uh, of international uh, experts. We have also uh, a, a, an Italian professor, Professor Nesi, who is a part of the, uh, the International Law Commission. And uh, one of the uh, of the topics it is uh, also the implication of the uh, uh, sea level rise for you no know, international law with the implication for access to, to fisheries. Uh, we see you know, that these topics are really you no know, cross cutting, and so you no know, they uh, they infiltrate you no know, in all of the fields of international law, and there you no know, we can see how you no know, these. Uh, uh, this fragmentation is uh, overcome you no know, to to in, in interpret in a co coherent way you no know, the different uh, uh, provisions rules of international law and uh, i think so in uh, particular in this uh, uh, request uh, for advisory opinion to the inter international tribunal for the law of the sea uh, there is an opportunity for the uh, for the uh, for uh, the international tribunal for the law of the sea it was, uh, to to have this uh, um, this uh, this perception and this uh, understanding <coughs> interpretation of international law in a in a in an harmonious in an harmonious way so to bring together this uh, constitution of oceans and not the uh, the convention on the law of the sea and the, uh, the, the Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Paris Agreement. So there is really an opportunity to read together these different uh, legal, uh, legal agreements. And so I, I, I think that this, this will be you know, really important also for, 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 the, for, for the perspective on, uh, on international law as a whole, to have uh, not this uh, comprehensive approach, you not know, to read together uh, different uh, uh, different instruments. And uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, but uh, I uh, no, I do I know that uh, you are both specialists in this uh, in this field. Uh, so you gave me the, the opportunity to start a reflection uh, on, the, on the law of the sea. Uh, I think that uh, the reason, uh, no, in the uh, past. Uh, uh, advisory request, uh, not the, uh, the, uh, the only one that there was uh, two or two or uh, another uh, one see my see bet mine but, but uh, <coughs> uh, 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 so there was a a, 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 a reference uh, no, to the fact also to interpret uh, different uh, to, to, to go beyond the, uh, the the UN convention on the law uh, of the sea uh, so I think you know, that this also can be used as a precedent for uh, uh, for reading uh, together you know, uh, different agreements, and uh, uh, so uh, also an another element that uh, so so it is interesting. I you know I mentioned the work of the International Law Commission on the uh, sea level rise. So we have uh, this. Uh, it, it was created a specific uh, commission of small island states. Uh, uh, so there, there are six uh, small island states uh, no, that are parties of this commission, and that it is this commission of small island states uh, that has submitted the request for an advisory opinion to the internet to uh, the International Tribunal for uh, for the Law of the Sea. And uh, uh, so the first issue, no, always the, the, the tribunal, uh, and uh, here I have also a friend that, uh, that uh, works also in this, in this field, so uh, we can uh, discuss also later with her. Uh, it's the issue of jurisdiction. So no, as uh, the, the, uh, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea jurisdiction, uh, no competence to, ad to address uh, this, uh, uh, this question. Most of the states agree 
that, uh, uh, that the, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea has this power to, to, to render an advisory uh, opinion. There are some, uh, uh, some states uh, that uh, would like uh, to, to have a clear sep separation between uh, the Convention on the Law of the, of the Sea and the Climate Change uh, Agreements. But I, 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 I think that uh, the, the advisory uh, opinion will be, uh, will be rendered. And the, of course, no, the second uh, issue, the substantive uh, uh, part, it is, no, as uh, Andrea mentioned, so the, the provisions of the, of the uh, Convention on the Law of the Sea no, are, uh, uh, are in interpreted uh, and applied in the context of climate change. So the first uh, issue, it is uh, no, how the, the duty to prevent, control, reduce uh, marine pollution is related uh, to uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the climate change and uh, here so this uh, uh, duty to prevent reduce control marine uh, pollution also includes as you as you saw you know, in the, the, the documentary uh, the acidification of the uh, ocean the, 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 the global warming uh, the, the warming of, of the of the water of the oceans and uh, 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 um, uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, CO2. Uh, and the, the second uh, aspect of the questions addressed to uh, ITLOS uh, it is related uh, to the general purpose uh, that we can say it is uh, of, the, of the convention, so the protection and the conservation of the marine environment. So this is a large uh, provision uh, that also no, uh, I, I think could easily, let's say, uh, include uh, not this uh, impact of the climate change uh, that we have uh, seen clearly in the documentary on uh, uh, on the uh, on the oceans. Uh, um, so uh, well, uh, an element. So we, uh, as, as, as I mentioned, no, there is also another advisory request for advisory opinion no, that was requested to the International Court of Justice. But in comparison with the advisory opinion requested to the uh, ITLOS, uh, there have been no comments that the resolution taken uh, no, by the, the, the UN General Assembly to request this advisory opinion is uh, very largely framed. So it, it will be probably more difficult for, for the International Court of Justice no, to, uh, to adopt, uh, the, the, uh, to, um, to read together no, different areas of international law. And in particular, in this request for advisory opinion, there is a clear reference to the rights of present and future generation. So no, it is also interesting because uh, also something no, that I would like uh, to, to mention, I think it is very important, it is that this request came come from youth mo movements. So no, the youth has played a, a very important role to bring uh, no, this, uh, uh, this issue to the UN General Assembly. It was especially the youth movement from the Pacific. So, uh, a big region of the world, but with, uh, of course, uh, not this, uh, this fear that uh, your country disappear, no? because this is the, uh, the real issue. So not this need uh, to ask uh, to international body to act uh, also through uh, advisory uh, request. And then we have also uh, a third advisory request that is uh, uh, made to the uh, international uh, to the uh, inter-American Court of of, uh, of human rights, and also this uh, will be you know, an opportunity to clarify this uh, uh, this interaction of uh, of bodies of of law. Uh, I, I think that uh, where where really you not know, the, the the judges have uh, a great opportunity you not know, to develop international law, probably these two ethos because we have really you know, a, a convention that can be you know, interpreted in the light of the impact of, of, climate, of climate change. And then, uh, uh, since uh, no, I uh, also you know, represent the Geneva Water Hub, uh, and you know, we are uh, an institution uh, specialized on uh, on, uh, on the use of water for, for, for peace and also you know, in our activities uh, uh, 
uh, we cover uh, uh, international law and, and, and water. So, uh, an important element it is that the most part of the pollution also that is impacting uh, uh, oceans and sea come from land-based pollution, so from rivers. And, uh, and, and it is important there that uh, the, the UNCLOS, the, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, cover you know, both type of, of, of pollution coming you know, from, uh, also coming from, uh, from the land. For example, we can think about plastics. And here again, you know, we have a, a new development of international law that it is you not know, a negotiation of a, a binding instrument uh, to, to end uh, uh, plastics and plastics you know, have huge uh, impact on, uh, on fresh water and salt water because uh, you know, many times you know, in, in, my, in my work there is this confusion between uh, the legal regime that apply to fresh water and the legal regime that apply to salt water, sea and oceans that is uh, more clear, we are, at least uh, my perception uh, to, to what it, it applies to, 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 to fresh water. But this is a topic for another conference. Uh, so this is uh, uh, many thanks for uh, your attention and uh, I hope to continue the discussion with all of you. Thank you. Many thanks, Mara. Uh, first of all, I'm sorry because I misspelled uh, earlier your surname, Martignino. Sorry, sorry, my, my mistake, my bad. Um, I think that it's uh, it's uh, it's very interesting. I mean, uh, to to think about all the uh, things you have been touching upon. Uh, I would say a couple of things in this respect uh, about the outcome, the possible consequences of this of these uh, procedures, which are pending. Which show, of course, the interest about the topic, because never, never uh, happened that uh, such an issue in these terms was brought at the attention of the, of such international uh, tribunals, such as International Court of Justice and uh, the ITROS, so International Tribunal for the Law uh, on the Sea. Uh, sure, I would. We will see how it will go. I mean, uh, the hearing phase was in one month ago, in September. So we will see when these advisory opinions will be rendered. Um, in one way or another, this, uh, these opinions, although not binding themselves, will have an impact at a political level, uh, at a um, public opinion level, and uh, uh, last but not least, at least surely one level of, of, uh, of analysis in terms of consequences. And then the second one, which is a hope, but I really want to believe that this will be the case, independently from what will be the outcome, I do hope that this opportunity will be taken to strengthen again even more the importance of scientific data. Because we can discuss about things under political point of view, under a legal point of view, and of course also under a scientific point of view. But once we have scientific data, which are, which are the outcome of the of scientific method, this should not be put in discussion uh, as they were, you know, uh, political theories. So I think this is very important to, to you know, to not stick to some, um, to some departure points when some scientific data are even put in discussion without, uh, without scientific method. This is an opportunity um, also to, to do that. Uh, in a couple of minutes, if, you, uh, if anyone from the, public, from the public wishes to uh, ask questions or share comments, uh, just introduce himself or herself. Uh, of course, you are more than uh, welcome. But before doing that, I just wanted to ask Andrea whether you have uh, um, you know, a last contribution to give to each of us. Thank you very much, Andre, and thank you, Mara, for the very interesting and instructive presentation. Um, yes, just a comment uh, connect with what you s just said. I think uh, what is important to understand uh, with advisory opinion is that the role of advisory opinions per se are, uh, is changing completely. In the last uh, uh, decade, we saw um, the political but also the legal impact of advisory opinions. 
recently, last year, there was um, a very important case. It was a case of the still a case of Hitler's, the Maldives Mauritius case, you know. And this case is very important. It shows you how the role of advisory opinion changes because uh, the tribunal concluded uh, that in that specific case, uh, Mauritius had standing. Uh, I mean, the arguments of Mauritius were were correct, based on a legal expectations which stemmed from the advisory opinion. And these, and there are clarifications in the separate opinions, for instance, of judges saying that indeed uh, there is a difference between legally binding, you know, instrument or instrument producing a legal effect. So the advisory opinion, you know, is not legally binding but produces a legal effect. And for that reason, of course, the states cannot ignore that. They need to take into consideration this aspect. So we can see the echo also that these advisory opinions, in any case, will have you know, when it comes to discussions uh, concerning uh, UNCLOS, uh, climate change. And also, uh, as Andrea rightly stressed, I mean, even the attention uh, on this uh, topic is, is, is very high. There were, I think, over 50 statements made by states and organizations uh, before Hitler's concerning this. So it clearly shows uh, you how important is, uh, is the discussion on this. Yeah, that's just this comment. Thank you. So, may you floor to the public or you want to add something? No, so, a a anyone wishes to share some points of view, some Experience uh, wants to. I don't know if there's any association, maybe uh, uh, whose mission is 